Cube, the cult sci-fi horror film of the late 90s in which a group of strangers must navigate a 3D maze of cube-shaped rooms. Some cubes contain gruesome traps our heroes must avoid, and all contain some gruesome maths our heroes must confront. Each room has a serial number, apparently encoding information about its location and whether the room contains a trap. There's a lot of talk about permutations, prime numbers, and the astronomical mental calculations required to navigate the maze, but how accurate is it? This film really surprised me, so in this episode of Maths, Mathematical Accuracy in Films, we're going to look at whether the mathematics of Cube checks out, but also how plausible it is that the characters would even be able to work out the required patterns in the first place, and after a short discussion of the film overall, we'll rank it on our two-axis plot. I hope you enjoy. If you haven't seen Cube, it's pretty good, and I'll do my best not to spoil the story. It's one of those stuck-in-one-location style films like Hitchcock's Lifeboat, Twelve Angry Men, and more recently films like Saw and Circle, which I think were influenced by Cube. The appeal is the puzzle. There's the story side to that, like what is the cube, who are our heroes, and why are they trapped there, but there's also the mechanical side. What do the numbers mean? What's that intermittent rumbling sound? How many rooms are there? The maze is made of cube-shaped rooms, each about 5 meters in length, with each face containing a door leading to another room of the same dimensions. The only difference between rooms is the color, and that some of them contain some pretty gruesome traps. It's because of this sadistic, oppressive, and industrial nature of the environment and traps, and some of the moral questions raised, that I think Saw owes a lot to Cube. The heroes realize quickly that some of the rooms contain traps, and I like how sensible and cautious they are in the beginning. The resourceful Ren figures he can throw his boot into rooms and set off any motion sensors that activate traps. That technique proves inadequate, however, when they encounter rooms with sound detection <laughs> and chemical sensors. The air seems dry in there. Trapped? Molecular chemical sensor. Why the hell didn't the boot set it off? The boot's not alive. Mathematics student Levin, who previously noticed that each room has a set of three three-digit serial numbers, notices something. It seems like if any of these numbers are prime, then the room is trapped. The molecular chemical thingy had 137, the acid room had 149. You remember all that in your head? I have a facility for it. Okay, I know I said I'd save my discussion of the film itself for later, but let's just acknowledge now that the acting and writing in this film is not the best. So she conjectures that if the serial number contains a prime, then the room contains a trap. My first question here is, how likely is it that she would have made that connection? Well, I actually think it's highly plausible. She's a mathematics student. She's presented with some three-digit numbers, some of which are somehow special. Really, what's the first thing you would look for? After things like parity and digital sums, I think primality is up there. She also conjectures the inverse. A serial number containing no primes is safe. And the film seems to be very contradictory regarding how capable a mathematician Levin is. 645. 645. That's not prime. Yes, a number ending in 5. I wonder if that could be prime. 372. No. Yes, an even number. Well done. 649. Right, 11 times 59. Oh, well, that's actually quite impressive. Good work. So she's able to execute prime factorizations pretty quickly, it seems. And between you and me, just remember that. With this hypothesis, our heroes take the sensible decision to travel in a straight line, thinking they'll eventually hit an edge. I must say, I like a horror film where there is at least some sensible decision making. Levin eventually makes another conjecture that the digital sum of each three digit number denotes the Cartesian coordinates of that room's position. Again, I think this is an extremely plausible inference. If they are traveling in a straight line, she will have noticed that two of the three numbers have a constant sum, while one is getting larger or smaller. It's not the sort of thing you notice right away, but there is a montage which implies they travel for a while before she makes that connection and, well, I believe it's something she'd eventually notice. What complicates things is that they later learn that the rooms slide around and change position. It's clear that only some of the rooms shift, otherwise the characters would have experienced motion in the room they're in much sooner in the film, but there's no insight into which rooms move. But Levin does realize that the numbers also encode how the rooms shift. Take a number like 972, which appears as the second number, so it refers to the y-axis. She figures that 9 plus 2 plus 7 is 18, is the starting y-coordinate, and then these cyclic subtractions denote the change in position. 
This tells us that the room will shift plus two, then plus five, then minus seven in the y direction over the course of its journey. If that seems like a huge leap in logic, that's because it is. I'm really not sure how Levin was able to work this out given the information we receive. What is interesting though is some of the ways in which this conclusion is utilized. The best instance is when they're in room 665, 972, 545. The subtractions tell us how the room shifts in the other coordinate directions as well, and then Levin figures that the cube will go through this journey. Zero in the x direction, then plus two in the y direction, then plus one in the z direction, then plus one in the x direction, and so on. How she figures this out, I have no idea. Notice that the numbers in each column always sum to zero, and that will always happen, and it's pretty easy to show. But that means that after all nine shifts, the cube will have moved zero in each direction, i.e. it's back to its starting position. I won't spoil it, but the characters cleverly realize that the key to solving the maze is to escape while the rooms are in the starting position. They've long lost track of time and how many shifts have occurred, but she is able to figure out how many shifts are remaining when they are in this room. So the room is initially in position 17, 18, 14, and then using the subtraction method, we can trace out the room's entire journey. So they know that they are in one of these nine positions, but there's no way to know which one because they don't know how many shifts there have been since the initial position. But then Levin asks for the numbers of the adjacent rooms. 666-897-466. And again, using the subtraction method, we can calculate how each coordinate of these rooms will change over the course of the film. Once we've calculated the positions of all the rooms, we can look across to see when these rooms will be adjacent, because to be adjacent means that two coordinates must be the same and one will differ by exactly one. And when we look, we realize this can't actually happen. I guess the numbers are more complicated than I thought. Maybe they mean nothing at all. Oh, Cube, you did so well. This is such a good idea. But look, the room they are in and this room on the end here can never be adjacent there's always at least one coordinate that differs by more than one. It's such a shame. I love this whole scenario, but in practice, it just doesn't work. However, I actually have a bit of headcanon that skirts around this issue. Now, this is just my opinion, but we do get some evidence in the film to support this. The film dodges the question of how this cube could actually exist in reality. For example, if the rooms are so packed together, how could they possibly slide around each other? but we do see some channels throughout the cube where the rooms can slide around. That means the structure is built with some gaps that allow the cubes some freedom to get out of the way and let other rooms slide through. It's also not shown whether these shifts happen in simultaneity. It might not be the case that all the rooms make their first shift at once. And in fact, if you try to do that in practice, it's probably impossible. So it's probably more like this room makes its shift, then another room makes its shift, then another room makes its shift, and so on. And actually, the scenes where we do see the cubes sliding around, that feels more true to what is actually happening. All that being said, when we conduct our analysis, we're looking for the closest possible situation where the room that we are in coincides with the other adjacent rooms in two coordinates and differs by exactly one in another coordinate as much as possible. We'll also add the condition that in one of these coordinates, the number has to be the same for all four of those rooms. And that's because they take readings in rooms on the same plane. So if that's the Y axis, or if that's the Z axis, or if that's the X axis, those have to be the same coordinate for all four of the rooms. If you look down the list of possibilities, there's only one that makes as much sense as possible. So it's not an exact science, but this possibility represents the situation in which all three of the neighboring rooms are as close as possible, and it makes the most sense given the constraints that we have. And in the film, that's the position that they conclude that they are in. X is 17, Y is 25, and Z is 14, which means this room makes two more moves before returning to its original position. Have I just made up a bit of headcanon to justify the conclusion they reach in the film? Maybe, but it's such a shame. They were so close. I think a rewrite of this scene could have made this an entirely plausible scenario. And I want to clarify, it doesn't matter. It's a film. We suspend our disbelief. But the fact that it gives us the numbers, it gives us the rules, they could have made the scenario actually realistic, and that would have been way more satisfying. So the concept is sound, the specific case isn't. And unfortunately, this is where things fall apart mathematically in other ways which are less forgivable. 
Earlier, the group discovered a counterexample to Levin's conjecture that the rooms with composite numbers are safe. Not prime. Stop! In front of you! I don't know what happened! Oh. It wasn't prime! The numbers are never spoken out loud to the audience, but Levin knows that the numbers in question aren't prime. Later, it is revealed that she has deduced the rule for which numbers correspond to trap rooms. Technically, I can identify the traps. Technically? At first I thought that they were identified by prime numbers, but they're not. They're identified by numbers that are the power of a prime. She says this with reluctance, because while she can recognize primes, the calculations required to calculate prime powers are, well... Look! Nobody in the whole world could do it mentally! Look at the numbers! 567, 898, 545? There's no way I can factor that! I can't even start on 567! It's astronomical! This is, to put it mildly, ridiculous. A mathematician of her caliber should have no problem doing this. All throughout the film, she's been able to recognize three-digit primes. How has she been doing this? She clearly doesn't have them all memorized, because they made a point about how fatigued she's getting from the calculations. She needs a break. She can do it. So she must have been attempting to factorize the numbers mentally. But if she can do that, like in this scene I told you to remember, she can recognize prime powers. There aren't even that many prime powers to think about. There are a bunch of powers of two which are instantly recognizable to anyone studying mathematics at most levels. There are a few powers of three and five, but again they're easy to recognize because it's obvious when a number is divisible by three or five, and then you can determine whether it's a prime power by successively dividing. And after seven squared and seven cubed, there are just a few more squares. Admittedly, these are less obvious, but she's smart. Work them out once and memorize them. Narratively, there's a reason for this mathematical misstep, and I'll get to that in a moment. But it's a shame that after a run of some pretty interesting mathematics, even if this specific case didn't work out, we finish with something so absurd. Now, as for quality, Cube is the sort of film that's quite dear to my heart. Low-budget, high-concept sci-fi. It tells a pretty compelling and tense story with very little. The visual effects are pretty janky, but that comes with the territory. And considering it was made on a small budget over 25 years ago, man do I feel old, it looks surprisingly good. My favorite aspect of the film is the setting. It's claustrophobic, it's oppressive. You really feel like this is the sort of place where you would lose your mind. Something I love about the film's production is because the budget was so tight, they could only afford to build one cube. The entire film is actually filmed in a single 14 foot by 14 foot space, with some extra panels for the shots where characters are looking from one room to another. They just replaced these gel screens over the lights so the rooms appeared to be different colors. It's cleverly done, with some smart cuts to create the sense that the space they are in is larger than what is really there. I'm a huge fan of these dirty tricks and shortcuts. When you're immersed in the story, your brain doesn't notice them. At a tight 90 minutes, the film doesn't outstay its welcome. We get a mixture of characters with interesting backstories, psychological conflict and drama, disagreements rallying together. The film expertly maintains tension and drip feeds information to keep the suspense high. There's also a wonderfully crafted nail-biting scene involving a sound-activated room that's just brilliantly composed. All that being said, as I said before, the acting is really quite terrible. The only decent performance is from David Hewlett, the smarmy, cynical asshole of the group. You might recognize him as the smarmy asshole from Stargate Atlantis, or from other small roles like the smarmy asshole from Rise of the Planet of the Apes. The writing is also pretty cringe at times. The script feels the burden of having to progress the story and pushes through the arcs of these characters, and while there are some touching moments, for the most part, it's pretty corny. I do like that the female characters come off well, one being the level-headed mathematician who does the bulk of the thinking work, and the other bringing the most humanity to the group. Though there is some casual male gazy sort of sexism where the prisoners strip to their undergarments and we see, for no reason, that the women have far shorter shorts than the men. The character I haven't spoken about yet is Kazan. It's strongly implied that Kazan has autistic spectrum disorder. We see behaviors like sensitivity to aspects of his environment. I want to go back to the blue room repetitive motions, which we commonly refer to as stimming, and he clearly takes difficulty in making eye contact and forming relationships with the others. I think for the most part, the portrayal is pretty good. However, it's worth pointing out that people with autism present in a huge variety of ways, from people like Kazan, who probably find day-to-day -day tasks difficult without support, to people like me, who can get by on minor, reasonable adjustments. It's kind of annoying that most autistic characters in film are on the more extreme end, leading some to think that every autistic person needs constant care and finds social interaction impossible. I bring this up because there's a stereotype here that I want to call out. 
Remember those astronomical calculations? Well, it turns out that Kazan is able to carry these out at lightning speed. Can you tell me the factor of 656? Six? 2. 779? Seven, seven, 2. 462? 3. Clear. Kazan might be what is called a savant, which has long been misconstrued as being synonymous with autism. Savant syndrome is a very rare condition whereby people display extraordinary abilities, typically in mathematical, musical, or visuospatial fields. Only about half of all savants are actually autistic, so while it is absolutely possible for a person like Kazan to be autistic and display savant-like abilities, I'd like to see a few more characters in film depicting a more diverse range of, well, the neurodiverse. What I love about the film's treatment of Kazan is that the only character who doesn't value Kazan as a person is the villain. Because he's the only one using slurs and making derogatory comments, the film clearly signposts that behaviour as wrong. The other characters value Kazan's humanity and treat him as an equal even long before he reveals his talents. And that's awesome. As for a verdict, I was really impressed by how much math the film managed to cover, until we got to that whole room situation that didn't quite work out, and that whole astronomical nonsense. So I was ready to go high on accuracy, but I am going to have to pull it down significantly. Quality-wise, Cube does great things with its micro-budget, manages to pull off a surprisingly compelling and suspenseful 90 minutes. The acting is bad, and that'll be a major hurdle for people wanting to invest themselves in the story, and the script could have used another pass. What does that mean? You suck at math? Maybe a few more passes. So, all in all, around here somewhere. Again, don't take the ranking too seriously, it's just a bit of fun. But what do you all think? Do you agree with its ranking relative to A Beautiful Mind? And what film should I break down next? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I'm enjoying the change of pace that producing these maths videos provides me, and I hope you enjoy watching them. I'm gonna try to alternate between these and my main mathematical videos for a while, and see how that goes. Massive thank you as always to my patrons who got to see this video about a month ago, and if you enjoyed my videos you should consider supporting me on Patreon as well, link below. This has been another Proof Under Another Roof, until next time.